Hello. Hello, Saul. Where are you? I am in Sydney in a quarantine hotel. Oh, my God. I, that... this, was, this was not what I scheduled when I signed up for this. Right. <laughs> right. So, wait, you were in a hotel, now the hotel, whole hotel is in quarantine. No, no. When I scheduled a talk on Long Now, I thought I would be calling in from San Francisco at a reasonable hour of the day. But oh, as it God. is, I find myself at 4 a.m. in a quarantine hotel in Sydney well. talking to you in <laughs> London, question mark? London, London, yes. I'm afraid it's a perfectly reasonable time for me. It's <sighs> 7.30 in the evening. How are you feeling? Fortunately, my jet lag says this is uh, the right time of day for me. It's about 3 p.m. Great, great. Well, then, it's, it's, everything's coming up, Millhouse. <laughs> I expect some cheerful children because there's no privacy in a hotel suite to jump Lovely. through the in a few moments if you don't mind that at all. And I will I will tremendously enjoy that. And so so when you say you're in a quarantine hotel though, is this like a, a sudden accident? Uh Australia um I, I think has its shit together in <laughs> <laughs> There are some countries out there that have, I've heard. It is interesting, having just listened to the last few minutes of your conversation about dark, darkness and, and fascism and the rise of illiberalism, but it was actually very reassuring to arrive at Sydney Airport and have one serviceman from the Navy or the Army for each of my family members and to be escorted by police to a hotel where police bring us our food and right. they stand guard, stand guard outside our room. And uh, we are here for two weeks and we get tested at the beginning and the end. And then that's how Australia has stopped right. this thing. That, that is quite reassuring. I was in, yeah. I was in Italy in um, February, just before you couldn't go to Italy anymore. And when we arrived, they took our temperatures in Italy in the mid of, middle of February. And I, st I don't think we're still doing that in the UK or certainly hadn't been until fairly recently. So yeah, it's true, liberalism. Is it useful when it comes to a pandemic? That seems like a big question. No, you know, I think, um, well, it's interesting. So I know I reside in the US and I have for 20 years now and watching the... I mean, stupidity is not useful when it comes to a pandemic. That's, that's certainly true. Yeah, but watching the amazing collapse of the US right now in, right. in so many ways, but the... Um, you know, and so obviously policing issues are of great concern in the US right now. But I have to say polite police that don't carry, carry large weapons are really quite lovely. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I love the tradition of the bobby, you know, all they have is a, all they have is a stick that's not that threatening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is, look, certainly gun control, I think, is something we can all get behind in terms of that being a good way to conduct a civil society. Yes. Uh, and once there's gun control, look, I, I don't think we've got any fewer corrupt police, racist police, et cetera, in the UK than necessarily than we have than there are in the US, but it's just harder for them to kill people because, you know, they're not carrying guns and nobody else carrying guns. Mostly, some people. Mostly. Mostly, it does seem like a reasonable, sen reasonably sensible decision for for people. So actually, yeah, I'm not sure that liberalism is the problem as much as individualism, and that right. that peculiar individualism that the U.S. has sold the world for 40 years. Right. Yes. Correct. Uh, individualism as a replacement for all sorts of things that individualism cannot possibly replace, uh, like. Yes, the ability to act collectively. But even, even I think the strain on our personalities is too great. I don't think most of us have enough personality to carry off individualism, actually. I come from, um, I grew up an Orthodox Jew. So that's a really like intensely communal world. And um, when I try to describe to people what it really means to be part of a community, I often say the thing is, it's not about friends. Everybody's got friends. A community is a structure that helps you get along with people you can't fucking stand. You know? <laughs> That's fabulous. <clears throat> That's what it is, right? There's like the lady at synagogue who every time she's just moaning about something and you cannot stand her. But the truth is when you were in hospital, she came to visit. And when she has a baby, you take food over. And that's a community. Is. This, 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 the, you're, you're, it's, it's quite a very different 
version of community than my wife who um, recently decided to go back to school to become a librarian and her father was intrigued as to why she would choose that. And she actually laid the blame back on him because when she asked him what she should do when she, she grows up, he said, well, you should really, you know, given the where the world is going, I think we are going to need community more than anything else. And so her reaction was, well, the central pillar of any good community is the librarian. So I mean, off she went. <laughs> she's not wrong. Certainly in the communities that I grew up in, the books were right at the heart of it. So now, look, I have a question to ask you regarding this long future long past behind and ahead of us. How do we come out of this pandemic better than we were before? Uh, that sounds like a leading question to me. I just finished a book on, on what we have to do to fix climate change. Okay, um, I want to know. I want to know. I'm, I'm a novelist, right? I'm, I'm trying to write somehow about, I don't know, all of this, how we can make some things better. So I want to know. Not not to avoid your question, but I will say that I was struggling to push the book out and I hired a professional writer who writes um, fiction to help me, a one woman called Laura Fraser. And working with a real writer was such incredible discipline. Um, and I think you have to make, if you want to engage people in fixing climate change, you have to make it a love story. Mm. And I have to say that working with her was fabulous. She actually did a New York Times bestseller about her uh, romantic fling in the Greek islands. So <laughs> she helped me do the romantic fling in the Greek islands version of fixing climate change. I love that. I love that. Uh, yeah. Like what, so oh, One of the things I was just talking about with Mian is um, I feel like a lot of these conversations end up with me feeling about climate change and about um, extinctions as well. I have like extinctions really make me feel very gross about being a human. <laughs> like just, just the idea that we're going around just going, oh, well, you know, really who can remember more than 200 kinds of birds? Do we need more than that? You know, um, I feel like that's sort of. Well, actually, you know, I think um, I have a lot of friends. I had another friend who really pushed me. We were actually sailing on a boat in the Greek islands. And he's like, why do you, uh, his argument was too many people just believe in climate change because it's the, the correct thing to do as a liberal. Um, where, <laughs> no, no, I think he's, it's like, he, I think he, what he was trying to say is most people don't question why they are concerned, why they have their skin in the game. Oh, I see. And what, what he means by why is a lot of people now say, well, we have to do it so we save the humans. I have to say for me, um, child of David Attenborough, <laughs> that I'm doing it for the birds that I haven't met yet. Right. Um, and right. Uh, I will say the last chapter of the book, it surprised me. I went through the book with this incredibly positive, optimistic, this is how you do a World War II effort. This is what you need to do. You need to electrify everything. This is how you can make it happen in 10 or 15 years. But the last chapter was like, you know, we can solve climate change and still kill all the things we care about. Mm. <laughs> You can still have an, a, a world of, full of uh, microparticles of plastic in the ocean. You can still destroy all the species. Right. Yes. Yes. Because, uh, yes, I think that's the thing. Obviously, climate change is terrible. The thing that really internally destroys me is um, habitat destruction and, and the idea that we're just, you know, taking away room from all the other species on the earth. Um, but so the question, the question that I have, and I feel like you are the person to answer it, is, okay. is, is um, how do I, how do I, how, when I think about all the terrible things that human beings have done to the planet thus far, how can I feel sufficiently okay about myself as to believe that we can then fix it? Um. I will actually refer to another person in the Long Now community, Kevin Kelly, who I walked with on Ocean Beach in San Francisco about six months ago, and we were having this conversation. And he had this beautiful word that he used. He says, we all believe in utopias. And I think the utopian vision of most people fighting to solve climate change is it will fix climate change and then everything will be peaceful and the world will be run by librarians and the police will only carry small batons. 
And he says, that's not really how humans work. It's like we live in a constant prototype of situation. And he thinks that we should aspire rather to protopia. Hmm. So we're constantly prototyping the utopia that we want to live in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what should give you some confidence that we will at least attempt it. We're going to prototype a new utopia where we sort of deal with climate change. Um, but it won't be perfect and it certainly won't satisfy everyone. And it won't satisfy everyone because some people want to save the birds and some people want to make more space for humans. Yeah, I think, I think certainly... Um... Oh, one of the mistakes I think that one can make in thinking about this is, is uh, not really accepting that there are quite a lot of people for whom our utopia would be a dystopia, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm living a little, you know, dystopia. I'm going to make it swim across the screen here. <laughs> so in my, I want to start a- well, Look, a I want to show you the thing that I'm holding here then. If we're going to show each other things, this is a 140 million year old Nautilus, um, which I keep on my desk because it makes me happy to remember that beauty existed before human beings. And Nautil even Nautilus if... are, are very important in my life. Oh, good. And so I, I love that you showed me a Nautilus. I'm now feeling ashamed that I was showing you a plastic fish full of soy sauce. This is just this this that is hope to me and it's a weird kind of hope but it's a hope that that this beautiful world created beauty before we existed and even if we wipe ourselves out it will carry on doing that and that is a dark hope but it's a good one and i hold on to it so there we go there's my yeah, i mean guy. Hum humans might just be the prototype for a thing that is the nautilus human which is the better evolution of us right be fine. So sorry, you were going to tell me about um, uh, uh, oh, here, fish here, filled with soy here, sauce. Here I am in a largely civilized society that's um, got its shit together on COVID and it has me in a quarantine hotel. And they bring me every meal in a plastic box for the four members of the family. But the one that just offends everything about my sensibility is this guy. Mm. So they bring me sushi, which obviously was not farmed very nicely. And the, not only did the, that poor tuna have to have the horrible indignity of being caught and then put on ice and shipped halfway around the world to feed me, but as its very last indignity, a little plastic baby fish is used to pour soy sauce on it. And then that plastic baby fish will go into the ocean to choke its ancestors. And so <laughs> I think this is, the, um, this is now de facto in so many parts of the world. Right. Yeah. Remember when Tupperware was the thing you bought once mm -hmm. and then you made the Tupperware last forever. I remember the excitement in my family in the seventies or eighties where the Tupperware had real value mm. and we washed it carefully. Now we get every single meal in disposable Tupperware. Right. Right. Um, I was actually having a conversation today with um, some friends where I was talking about, you know, my, my grandma was a member of the communist party but she was pretty racist um you know she wasn't sort of an active racist she was just somebody who kind of was racist i mean in the sense that she didn't go out burning things but she sort of you know um had views about people who had different skill, skin colors Cult culturally culturally racist maybe yeah yeah uh, and then my dad very anti-racist very specifically and very robustly and the way that i was educated even as an orthodox jewish girl was you know very very anti-racist but he is i would say homophobic um again not well actually he is a little bit actually the homophobic so anyway so i remember thinking about this when i was a young woman and looking at them and going Oh, well, for me, obviously, you know, I was born in 1974. So for me, I grew up in a generation where like every right thinking person went, um, oh no, like being gay is great. Why not? Um, and so I remember looking at the two of them and going, I wonder what the thing is that's gonna come along when I'm in my forties where I will go, I will be tempted to be like, oh no, that's a bridge too far, actually, sorry. And I do feel like it's, ha it hasn't, <laughs> I feel like it's happened to a lot of 
women of my generation ish in the UK in particular, where they're like feminist and pro gay rights, but somehow anti trans in some way, which seems to be the new thing happening in the UK. And then I was thinking, well, what what is the thing that I don't know? I don't know how you mentally juggle arriving at that position, but I, I, I humans are good at that. <laughs> right, right, right. There's a whole that is a, such a large conversation, and it can just capture any conversation that I don't even want to get started on it. Um, it, yeah, it, it's it's complicated why that has particularly happened in the UK and not not e.g. even in America, let alone Australia. Um, but then we were talking, my friends and I were talking about this sort of pro, this 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 trajectory, and then what we thought that when we are in our eighties. Uh, our grandkids would be looking at us and going, I can't believe grandma did that. And I can't believe grandma said that. And we thought it was literally, we would have received something in the beautiful reusable packaging that you're supposed to get. And then you're supposed to like leave it out for the next thing, you know, and we would just throw the packaging away. And, or we would be going, oh no, I like the straws that are individually wrapped or, so, or I miss that, you know. So that's an interesting place for you to arrive. And I, and for sure, I really hope that we receive terrible judgment, but what is the ism that that is? Right. I think that you, you, you were so pro disposalism. Yeah. You were, you were disposalist. You were, you yeah. were a disposaler. You were just, so, a, yeah. Let's tie disposalism, which I think is a huge problem back to your question, which I still haven't answered to your satisfaction which is how do you solve climate change? Um, I think once the heavy breathing about carbon sequestration is over, um, what I mean by the heavy breathing is a lot of people really are pro. If you look at all of the materials that humans touch every year, all of the dirt, all of the metals, all of the plastics that we make, the one thing that humanity makes in the largest quantity is carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Like we, we make, in America, I remember these numbers, they make, six million tons of everything that isn't carbon dioxide every year six mm -hmm. yeah six thousand million so six billion tons of everything that isn't carbon dioxide and they make six and a half billion tons of carbon dioxide <laughs> so the idea that we're going to capture something the size of all of the other stuff all of our concrete all of our plastic all the other things and then magically bury it in a hole i think you know we'll, we'll eventually get over that idea so right. once you're over that idea, you realize that we can't use any of these fossil fuel things and everything has to ultimately come from electricity. And then you start doing all the math. And so how many, you know, how can we create all of that electricity? How many wind turbines, how many solar cells, et cetera, et cetera, how many batteries? And then if you, you know, my book, now this should, this is probably the ism that I will be criticized for. I will be, um, my grandchildren will judge me for being pro-American dreamism. Ah, interesting. Not oh, because we I'm... will be judged as progressivists. We believed in the concept of progress. Sorry, carry on, I interrupted you. Yeah, also that, I think, is a good one. Um, we, we should come back to progressive, the problem with progressivism. Yeah. Um, but uh, so the, the, I think, unfortunately, well, backing up, 150 years after the publishing of The Origin of the Species, I, on the anniversary of, of that uh, Darwin's book, I looked up roughly, estimated how many people in the world believed in evolution versus not, and we did not yet have quorum. <laughs> and so uh, I think climate change is even more difficult as an abstract to understand than mm -hmm. evolution. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're going to have to solve climate change without quorum. Right. Once you have arrived at that idea, then I think you have to sell people on solving climate change because they're going to like it for selfish, consumerist, right. plastic, right. Fish, it's plastic be, fish reasons. And I do actually believe that. I think once we get over the horrible hump of changing from one system to another, we, we'll, we'll arrive somewhere where we go, oh, no, actually, this is really nice. Oh um, yeah, it's going. It will be really nice. And yeah. this is the whole the whole ruse of my book is it will be really nice. And the reality is, if we electrify everything, we'll use half as much energy. Um, the air quality in our homes will get better because currently we would burn methane inside our house all day and, it and that's one of the leading causes for 
child respiratory problems and we have burning things in our driveways that um, are a yeah. huge problem and all of yeah. the noise outside. No, I had a majority. little person who lives in my house wait, it woke me up at um, four o'clock this morning because just coughing and coughing and coughing because the air pollution in London is so terrible. And I think about oh, that. Yeah, I, I just came from California, which is on fire. We stuck inside right. for four weeks now to Australia where the fire season is about to begin. Anyway, we, we, we electrify everything. All of those things improve. But then when you do the math, we're going to have to make about, um, do you speak in kilograms or pounds? Kilograms I can do either. I'm, either. In the UK, we somehow do both, but not in a consistent way. We're going to need, we're going to need 40 or 50 kilograms uh, of batteries to be produced for every person who lives an American lifestyle every year in perpetuity. That's a lot. And we're going to need 25 kilograms or 50 pounds of solar cells. This is if we use batteries that look like today's batteries, the solar cells right. look like today's batteries, and they need to be produced in perpetuity for every year. And so that is quite a lot. And you think about that, that's an awful lot of tech, very highly technical trash. Mm -hmm. That um, sounds like we might need to work out how to use less energy. We could figure out how to, you, you know, we can figure out how to use a little less energy, I think, and, and we will. Um, but I actually think you have to anticipate that in the protopia that emerges, we're going to use a little bit more energy than the environmentalist wants. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be doing it with more toxic materials than we want to admit. And we're going to be still mining a lot of, you know, mineral salts in Bolivia and a lot of rare earth metals in the Congo. Mm hmm so I think those compromises will still exist. And I, and, and I actually, so I think the world will improve, but the big emphasis for me is like, how do we then, how do we get to 100% recycling of those things that are really damaging? And then how do we get rid of these guys? Mm. <laughs> um, progressivism. Let me give you a little rant that... Um, about the environmentalist movement. So we had Earth Day in 1970, which... I wish I could talk to Stuart at length about what it was like to be there. Like you, I was born in 74. You and I were born just after the oil crisis began, right in the middle of it, really. Um, the environmentalist movement didn't really know what to demand next after Earth Day. And then the oil crisis came along. And the oil crisis in America and in most countries was a crisis of importing 10 or 15% of its energy. So. Mm -hmm the US tried to figure out how to fix the energy crisis, the oil crisis, and they decided efficiency was the way. If every car is 15% more efficient and if every home uses 15% less energy to heat it, then we'll solve the oil crisis. Right. And that gave us modern environmentalism because we now had an efficiency narrative. Oh, the thing to do is to go with efficiency. Mm -hmm. And we've been beating the efficiency drum for 40 years. But efficiency sounds to most people, including the progressives, as the thermostat's a little too cold and the car's a little too small. Mm. And efficiency also isn't a narrative that gets you to any end goal because efficiency, efficiency in your way to zero means eventually having nothing. <laughs> Right. So right. You, I don't know. I don't know what you're going to cling to as the last efficiency is squeezed from your life. Is it the headphones and your Zoom connection or is it your bicycle or is it your car? But we have to have something. <laughs> and I think it is in killing off the efficiency narrative and finding a transformation narrative that we have to give birth to a new environmentalism. All right. Break that down for me. Tell me what your narrative is that you're talking about there. Um, I want you to write the love story where we grapple with this 50 year liberal progressive narrative, even a little bit neoconservative that efficiency will solve all problems. Mm -hmm. Efficiency sounds conservative, right? We had all the forces of darkness on the side of efficiency. Yeah. But now we need to transform ourselves to, you know, I think people starting to play with the word circular economy. I'm still not quite sure I know what that means in, to in totality. Right. This is, this is, this is um, presumably, I mean, I have a degree in some part of my degree is in economics ridiculously, even though I don't really know about much about economics, but this idea that can we go on getting perpetual growth 
out of the world. Well, we can in the sense that we have to value different things, right? But um, perpetual economic growth is not the same as constantly strip mining. Uh, economic growth is about creating value. And if we decide to value different things, then we create like, more economic growth. But I guess that's okay. can, I, can I just interrupt to say that the constant growth that I want is an ever expanding library for my librarian to live in. Right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, I mean, we can have constantly expanding growth in the field of um, personal development, you know, spiritual development. We can certainly have ever expanding growth there and deepening our love for and appreciation of the natural world. If we decided to value that more than we value anything else, then our economy would look extremely different. Uh, if we decided that we would value our internal states um, and people who can help us with our internal states as the highest priority in the world, which would include everything from musicians to comedians to therapists, right? Then so, so, so given my anecdote about evolution and climate change, how does your we decide? I know, understand your question. Which we? Oh, wait, which we? You were saying we decide, the royal we. Yeah. Oh, right, <laughs> right, right. I mean... <laughs> Given that we still don't agree that we evolved and we still probably, we yeah. for sure don't agree that we can affect the climate, how does the I, we decide this in time? I, I am a novelist. <clears throat> My job, as you may have heard me saying at the end of the previous conversation, is to move things along a bit by suggesting some new ways of thinking about stuff. So my job is potentially to speak to people who haven't thought about this before and to go, oh, why do we? Why is our world organized in this way? And maybe we could organize it in a different way. And then, you know, my, <laughs> my dad's a political historian and he always says politics is the art of the possible, right? Whereas novels are the art of the impossible. Um, politics is the art of going okay we're not going to get everybody to vote for this so what are we actually going to get ha to happen that will work and that's also the art of leading change in large organizations which i know people who do that and i admire them tremendously but my job is like going hey what would it look like if actually we all valued nautilus right the nautilus the beautiful <laughs> why is the nautilus important to you before before we say goodbye uh, my mother, who is, um, is probably a first wave feminist and first wave environmentalist or second wave feminist, probably actually first wave. I, I can never keep track of the waves. Just, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, she was early in both of those things. Um, and she was an artist and she, uh, was a study of Sir Joseph Banks and the art of the voyages, Captain Cook's voyages of discovery, the mm -hmm. botanical art. So she spent a huge part of her career painting and drawing and actually using printmaking for all of the critters and creatures and landscapes of the world. This is why I, I feel like I was in fact raised by a feminist, David Attenborough. <laughs> and so perfect. I had this- Can she raise I, the I was, rest of us? <laughs> it was unbelievable. And I think honestly, if my mother could raise us all, we, we would have, I, I'd have a lot of hope. And so we spent all of our holidays looking for Nautilus or whatever creature it was. And I had, um, she did these amazing etchings, one in particular, which had the cross section of the Nautilus and the Nautilus swimming and the, cra the crazy creature that lives inside this amazing piece of geometry. Mm. And um, the, the, so the Nautilus is seared in my mind because it literally hung above the, my bed in my childhood bedroom. As oh, wow. <laughs> And Aww. then we had all, all sorts of Nautilus fossils and shells around the house, um, some that we collected ourselves. So I love it. Well, it reminds me of my mum. Oh, well, this guy <laughs> travels with me when I travel sometimes. Um, wow. Yeah, because I don't know, that seems like <laughs> that, that, that seems like deep time. There's 140 million years. So um, I like to I'm be reminded that. of that. I have a seven-year-old daughter and 11-year-old son and my wife is fabulous and we just relocated our whole lives to Australia for the year and when we got to our quarantine hotel room my daughter started unpacking her bag and the first thing she unpacked was a tea set and then I noticed that my wife had helped my daughter pack a porcelain tea set and I thought how absurd that we just bought a porcelain tea set around the world but there is more absurd you can take a Nautilus it, 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 it's, it is pretty absurd but also you know, wonderful we, we all need our inefficiencies right that's 
All human activity is folly, so it's a nice folly. 